In my last video, I talked about recommending products with both straightforward and more sophisticated approaches. Today, we'll talk about content. Sometimes, content platforms need recommender systems even more. Hi, I'm Alex, data science competence leader at Altexart, and we are going to discuss content recommenders today. Who should be using them? And how do they work? Back in 2006, Fortune writer Jeffrey O'Brien conceptualized the way the internet was about to change. He said that we are moving from the era of search to the era of discovery. What does it mean? Search and discovery are two main ways people find new information on the internet. The search works with narrow and specific requests, those that you Google and use filters to specify. And then you find what you are looking for. Discovery means that an application shows you content or products that you did not think of before, did not know they existed. But these content pieces or products appear relevant to you all of a sudden. The discovery driver is very powerful in recommending content. Why? Most content platforms of today thrive on user engagement, which is the time the user spends on one platform and either clicks on commercials or pays a monthly subscription. Such platforms as Spotify, YouTube, Netflix are competing for human attention. For instance, from 2015 to 2019, the average time an American child spent on YouTube has doubled from half an hour to an hour per day. But the overall screen time spent on media and games stayed roughly the same, about five hours. This means that YouTube was successful in capturing this half an hour from other media. The key to retaining users is discovery, not search. I admit, sometimes you know what you want and search for it specifically. But if you did find the content piece you were looking for, most likely you are going to leave the platform right after you finished it watching or reading. You are done. But if you discover something else worth reading or listening to, you stay or come back later. 80% of all streaming time on Netflix comes from recommended content, 70% of all watch time on YouTube, 80% of all user engagement on Pinterest, and according to some estimates, 30% of all streaming on Spotify. These are impressive numbers. So does your content platform need a recommender system? First, consider which of the two drivers is more important for you. Is it search? You have to look at the way people interact with your content. Shutterstock, a stock photography platform, has powerful search algorithms, but it doesn't quite use the discovery logic. Because Shutterstock users come with specific image requests in mind, they are not browsing for inspiration. But Pinterest users, on the opposite, actually expect to get inspiration and rely on recommended images that Pinterest Pixie system suggests. Okay, if your content platform is more geared towards exploring new content pieces rather than finding specific ones, it's worth considering a recommender system. So, how do content recommenders work? Let's start with the most basic approaches and then explore more advanced things that are used in the industry. Surprisingly not, many content recommenders don't rely on machines as much. In the used-to-be-popular story aggregator dig.com, editorial staff curates the stories that go to the front page. Vimeo, the platform for professional video creators, also has a major content discovery feature, which is called Staff Picks. And it speaks for itself. Vimeo has a team of professionals that manually curate the best content. While it seems outdated, this approach works well with a limited number of content pieces. And if your audience knows that humans are behind recommendations, it actually brings more trust. The problem here is, your people are the bottleneck. It's obvious, you can't cover massive amounts of content. Another slightly less obvious drawback is that these recommendations are always non-personalized. They are not tailored to each individual person. So, now let's talk about really personalized recommendations. If you watched my other videos about recommender systems, you know what content-based filtering means. But it still can get slightly confusing. 
Content-based filtering uses specific attributes of items, their content, to make recommendations. But this technique can be used both with content, like music and videos, and products, like cars or TVs. For example, music has such content attributes as genre, artist, or the year of release. And TVs have some other attributes, like screen size or panel type. So, we'll have to deal with two different meanings of the word content in the same video. Sorry for that. As weird as it sounds, pure content-based filtering is not the most popular approach to recommending content. But still, some companies use it. As I said, content-based filtering means looking at specific attributes that users like and matching those with attributes that your content has. A popular music streaming service, Pandora, mostly relies on this technique in their recommendations. Each song in Pandora library has about 450 attributes. These attributes, or features, help define sort of a DNA of the song and match the track with individual users' preferences. Pandora employs machine learning to predict how likely this set of features of a song is going to resonate with that particular user and their tastes. The first drawback of this approach is that most of the content doesn't have apparent features to extract, and it gets technically challenging to understand which features actually have meaning. A person may like, say, romantic comedies from the 80s or classical rock music, but attributes like romantic comedy or classical rock are just a fraction of all attributes that make up the final experience. This doesn't necessarily mean that the person will laugh from any comedy or like Guns N' Roses. And this leads to another major problem for Pandora, as they have to engage music experts to label each song with a whopping 450 attributes. They just can't upload thousands of content pieces at once and start recommending them. For this reason, most content recommending companies opt for another superstar technique called collaborative filtering. The general idea of collaborative filtering, as I explained in my previous videos, is that you don't look at specific attributes of texts, songs or videos. You try to understand which users like the same songs and which content pieces are liked by the similar users. And then you recommend the content that other people with similar tastes like. Spotify considers this problem as a missing track in the playlist. If Joel has almost the same songs in his playlist as Ellie does, but he has never listened to Take On Me from Ellie's playlist, Spotify will recommend it to Joel. Collaborative filtering is the foundational approach for most content platforms. YouTube, Pinterest, Spotify all use collaborative filtering as their core recommendation logic. But it has a serious drawback – data sparsity. Sparsity means that sometimes we may not have enough data to match users and content. If we have a small number of users and a lot of content, most of it will be left unread, unwatched, and listened. For collaborative filtering to succeed, you need to have a lot of users that actively consume this content and send you signals about what they like or dislike. Yeah, it's a good idea to like the video at this point. If you have a lot of content, but little to no meaningful interactions with it, launching collaborative filtering is not viable just yet. Another problem. How do you start recommending a brand new content piece? A new video has just been uploaded and no one has ever watched or rated it. How do you understand that this video is a good fit for Jesse, but a bad one for Dylan? This is known as the cold start problem. Well, you can sometimes randomly suggest this video to viewers and gradually learn who likes it and who doesn't. But there are smarter ways to solve it. For example, Roll back and look at the item's attributes and apply both collaborative and content-based filtering. While collaborative filtering remains the driver of most content recommender engines, almost none of them use this technique only. Usually they have hybrid systems. Let's imagine that no one has ever listened to a new song. How do we recommend it? We can use content-based filtering here extract some features from a new song and find similar popular songs. For instance, Spotify doesn't have professional musicians labeling songs as Pandora does, but they create spectrograms of all songs and apply computer vision to find similarities inside these spectrograms. This way, 
They can compare a less popular song with a more popular one, even without a lot of real interactions. YouTube also uses collaborator filtering as the main recommendations driver, but extracts content attributes from videos to make initial comparisons. So, eventually, more advanced recommender systems usually have both content and collaborative features. Finally, I would like to talk about another side of a cold start problem – users themselves. How do you recommend to someone new? Unfortunately, there aren't elegant and very efficient solutions here. You all remember that Netflix suggests users to like several initial movies to let it know your preferences. The same happens at Spotify and other music streaming services. YouTube does a different thing. It starts with general trending videos in your region. But once new users have a critical mass of consumed content, they start receiving pretty good recommendations. Okay, that's it for today. I hope you liked the video. If you did, give it a thumbs up. Next time, we'll talk about a specific case of recommender systems. The next best action. See you!